Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, for part two of our series on integrated pest management, or IPM, we'll be talking about IPM and cover crops with Dr. Chris Proctor. IPM is a system by which pests are controlled using informed decision-making techniques. Cover crops are crops planted between cash crops like corn or soybean. In this episode, Chris will walk us through the relationship between the two, including the history of cover crops and IPM, how cover crops suppress pests like weeds, and some stories of success. Thank you to Kellogg Company for sponsoring this episode. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today we have Chris Proctor with us. Chris grew up in the Pacific Northwest. He has a bachelor's and master's at Washington State University. He moved to Lincoln, Nebraska 10 years ago, where he got his Ph.D. at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He's worked at UNL in Extension for the last five years in wheat science. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks. Good. Good to be on. Excellent. We are so happy to have you. Today we are talking about integrated pest management and cover crops. So can you just give us some general background on kind of the history of cover crops, how they've been used in IPM before, as well as like what are some of the problems that arose that led to um, cover crops being used and uh, yeah, just why we use them today? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, when I think history of cover crops is kind of interesting in that most of the cover crops we use today are crops that have been around for a long time, and so they've been used in different ways throughout history. You know, a lot of examples uh, go back to when we used to use horses for plowing our fields. Uh, The diversity in the landscape was a lot greater because we needed a lot more forage crops available. Uh, just for feeding all the animals that were in the farmstead. And now as we've, you know, tractors have been invented and, and, and those sorts of things, you know, we just don't need the number of forages that we once did. Uh, and so I think there's just been a steady progression in, in farming that is, as technology has advanced, uh, our ability to farm more acres efficiently has improved. Uh, and it's also we've also moved to uh, smaller rotations. So for much of the Midwest, right, the, the common rotation is uh, corn and soybean. Um, and we've gotten really good at growing corn and soybeans, and we can do it on large acres, and we can do it really efficiently. Um, like anything uh, in the world, there's always trade-offs. You know? And so as, I think as we've gained uh, in terms of uh, those efficiencies, I think there's, there's been things that we've, we've recognized as uh, challenges or consequences to those changes. And so I think as we've recognized some of those, that, that loss of diversity in our system and the impact that that might have, uh, I think that's led to an interest in, in cover crops. And another big thing I think that's driven it is is when we think more specifically about weed control. Historically, weed control is primarily done by tillage. I mean, it's a really effective means of weed control. And that's how most uh, weeds were controlled in, in early on in, in a lot of our cropping systems is, is through tillage. We also recognize uh, some of the, the detrimental effects to tillage over time. You know, it predisposes us to both wind and, and water erosion uh, of the soil. Uh, uh, it tends to, you know, disturb just the soil structure um, and, and the impacts that that might have. And so uh, as herbicides were developed uh, over time and the herbicide technology improved, well, that allowed us to control weeds with a different mechanism. And really that was uh, how no-till came about. Uh, no-till practices were, or reduced tillage practices came about uh, in large part through the development of, of herbicides and the ability to use herbicides. But as herbicides were used more uh, more and more in our in our systems, and really with the development of uh, herbicide resistant crop, both uh, soybean and corn were and cotton were um, invented that allowed us to spray glyphosate over those crops, which typically wouldn 't uh, be resistant to glyphosate through uh, the engineering process now are resistant to glyphosate. Well, that, that allowed us to improve our weed control in those systems uh, dramatically and, and to utilize uh, no-till practices or reduced till practices uh, to a large part. But uh, again, uh, it's sometimes as we make progress, we, we then recognize uh, some of the challenges that come with that. And so 
Uh, continued use of, of herbicides over time, uh, glyphosate in particular, uh, in these systems uh, led to uh, herbicide-resistant weed populations. So applying glyphosate over and over again to the same weeds began to select for or create mutations that, that led to uh, herbicide resistance where, where these weeds that once were controlled by glyphosate were no longer effectively controlled. And so now we have situations where you, know, you could have a large herbicide-resistant population of weeds in your field, and if if you don't have the effective tools or the herbicide tools for controlling those weeds or they get too big before you're able to control them and they escape, uh, well, it can cause you know high yield losses, you know, 70%, 80% yield loss in some instances where those escapes occur. And so now we're starting to think, what are some other things we can use in our system that's going to help us manage these herbicide resistant weeds and so there's there's all kinds of strategies that are being employed uh, but the one i think we'll focus on today that i think is of real interest is is how can we use cover crops uh, as a tool in our toolbox uh, for managing these herbicide resistant weeds yeah that's a great overview so can you tell me some of the techniques that you would use in applying these cover crops uh, some of the ecosystem services they provide or, or kind of like the benefits that they provide to their ecosystem. Uh, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, you know, when you think of, of cover crops, there's a number of different reasons why a grower might be interested in implementing a cover crop into their farming system. And, you know, probably most commonly would be you know, issues of soil conservation, uh, so ways of managing managing soil properties and improving their soil properties. Uh, you know, there's there's some work done looking at uh, nitrogen fixation. So if you're growing a legume, you might, you might be able to add some nitrogen back into your system. And so there might be a benefit from integrating those types of cover crops uh, into your system. Uh, sequestering soil carbon, so increasing your organic matter, uh, adds a lot of benefits to your system. Uh, just overall soil health, there's a lot of talk about soil health now and cover crops uh, can play a a key part in that, uh, you know, soil water uh, and and water quality, uh, feed for livestock. Right? There's a, there's a long list we could we could go down in terms of uh, thinking about why you might grow cover crops. Uh, but as you mentioned and, and I alluded to earlier, uh, cover crops also uh, have benefit in that they they have an ability to suppress weeds. Uh, so you might be able to grow a cover crop for for weed suppression. Um, and so when we think about most of these these benefits uh, and weed weed suppression in particular, uh, it's cover crop biomass that tends to drive it. So the more biomass you can produce, uh, generally the higher the benefit from the cover crop. And so a lot of managing cover crops has to do with how much biomass can you produce. Uh, but again, anything in these integrated systems, uh, we always tend to fall back to uh, what are the trade offs. And so there, there's always the potential that you can produce too much biomass to the point that you might have a negative impact on your primary crop. So there's kind of a, a tension there that you kind of have to play with in that how can we maximize, say, weed suppression, for example, without having a negative influence on, on cover crops. And so most cover crops uh, grown in the Midwest, you know, behind corn and soybean, uh, that can be a real challenge because you don't have a, a large window for growing these cover crops. And so when biomass is what's needed, you need growing season to produce biomass. You know, you need, you need all the things that plants need to grow, uh, temperature, sunlight, uh, water, uh, all, all, these, all these things that, that plants need. And, and as you get towards the end of the season, you know, if a, a corn crop or a soybean crop isn't harvested until... Uh, mid-October or say even November, well that doesn't leave much time in kind of the northern uh, parts of, of the U.S. Uh, for, for growing a cover crop. And so there's a lot of uh, a lot that, that goes on in terms of trying to, uh, what, are, what are ways that we can work to integrate these cover crops more effectively in these, in these systems? Sure. And um, I know there's been s so typically for me, my understanding of cover crops is they're kind of like between cash crop uh, harvest. So you'd have your cash crop of corn or soybean, and then you would have a little bit of time where you grow this cover crop um, so that they can provide their benefits. But I also know there's a lot of talk of being able to like kind of interseed them in like contrasting rows is that like a different category for you do you still count that as a cover crop um 
or no? And is there like, are there big differences in the ecosystem services they're going to provide if you're handling it one way or the other? Is there a suggested way to do that? Yeah, no, I think that it's helpful to, to distinguish some of these categories. Uh, you know, when, when I think cover crop, uh, usually end use probably drives it more than anything. Uh, and so a cover crop is usually grown for one of those ecosystem services that we mentioned earlier, whether it be soil or weed suppression, uh, so on. You know, if it's if it's being grown for feed, then it would be more of a forage, right? And so so your how you use it, when you use it, might be a little bit different. But if we're thinking cover crops particularly, yeah, usually it's either grown uh, like you mentioned uh, after the harvest of the primary crop. And so you would go and, and, and seed it into the field, drill it into the field often behind the harvest of that primary crop. Uh, and we have found that the earlier you can harvest and the earlier you can establish that cover crop, so if you can go in quickly after harvest, uh, you improve your, your likelihood of success. And then also uh, delaying termination in the spring. So anything you can do to extend that window of cover crop growth, uh, which would make sense, uh, tends to improve the amount of biomass you can grow. So you can delay termination, which would uh, also delay planting of that cover crop in the spring. Uh, but given that, that short window, there's been a number of uh, innovations uh, looking at you know how, how can we extend the season of the cover crop without maybe detrimentally impacting our our primary crop. And so interseeding is, is one that, that you had mentioned and, and has been used uh, fairly effectively. And so early on, a lot of the interseeding was done late in the season. Uh, so in soybeans, you might think of the time of the, the year as those leaves are starting to yellow just before they drop. Uh, either an airplane would fly over and drop cover crop seed uh, over top of that canopy, or you might have a high clearance uh, machine that could drive through the crop and broadcast seed through the field that way. Uh, so in, in, and it could be also in corn too, at, at late stages of a development in the corn as the leaves start to dry down and that canopy opens up a little bit, you could broadcast inner seed. Uh, but more recently, there's been work looking at drill inner seeding. And most of the work has been in corn. Uh, corn tends to uh, be a little better system because the canopy isn't quite so dense, meaning, uh, there's light that can get through the canopy down to the soil uh, in corn uh, more than soybean. Soybean tends to have a really dense canopy and, and, and captures most of the light uh, available. And so it makes soybeans a lot more challenging to do. But say early on in the season when the corn is, is uh, at the V3 to V5 stage, so, oh, that's probably... Uh, you know, 12 to 18 inches tall, uh, when you can still drive through the field with a, uh, a piece of equipment and they, they've designed these high clearance drills that can go over top of the corn rows and then drill uh, cover crops in between the planted corn rows. And there's been some success uh, looking at that. The biggest challenge certainly is, is making sure you have enough light for that cover crop through the season. But uh, the real benefit comes at the end of the season is you have a cover crop that that kind of got its feet under it, if you if you will, and grew throughout the season uh, slowly, usually because there isn't a lot of resources available when it's growing under the corn canopy. But then as soon as harvest happens, it opens that canopy up and that cover crop is already in the ground and it can take off quickly and, and, and produce uh, quite a bit of biomass then in the fall and, and has a head start uh, if it's a winter hardy cover crop all the way into the spring. And so there's an there's a, uh, opportunity there for, for growing cover crops um, uh, in corn, and we've done a little work in soybean, but as I mentioned, uh, it's it's quite a bit more of a challenge uh, because of the canopy of soybean is so much more dense, and the light tends to shade out the cover crops to the point that they don't survive the season. Sure. Yeah, that's super fascinating because I'm just trying to think of, like, the logistics of how to get those seeds in there and like without wasting a bunch of seeds from like getting caught in like I'm imagining you know corn leaves have they point upward obviously so just like having all the seeds just like fall in there and then just have nothing happen or how to like drive equipment that is on the scale you need to do this without damaging the crops is super fascinating to me so I like that yeah. a lot um yeah, I'm just, my mind is just imagining all these, like, spidery-looking, cool, like, futuristic machines, which is, like, probably not what it is, but I like to think that maybe it could be. No, it's um, cool. It is cool, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, super neat. Um, 
I feel like I had another question related to this, but it has slipped out of my mind in my excitement. So we'll just um, maybe move on a little bit here. Um, but yeah, that is super helpful to, to know about those. Um, and then we also, um, I mean, obviously what you're going to use and how you're going to use it is going to change drastically based on where you are. You already alluded to that a little bit talking about, um, you know, kind of the farther north you go when you have to deal with things, you know, dying over the winter, that kind of thing. But can you give us a few uh, success stories that you have seen in um, in cover crop usage for IPM? Um, before you do that, though, I, I re-remembered my question. So for how the biomass is actually working on weed suppression is it primarily because it's like choking things out at the root level is it because it's creating the canopy that makes it difficult for them to get what they need a uh, little bit of column a column b how does the how do cover crops actually suppress the weeds mechanically speaking yeah no that's a good question um and i think it I suppose I've learned with with plants, it's usually kind of an all of the above kind of situation. <laughs> we we just realize that there's there's a lot of things that interact uh, in these systems. Uh, but I'd say most most typically, when you think of of a cover crop suppressing weeds, usually that's you, you've generated enough biomass on the on the soil surface, or or even growing cover crop. You know, you, you have a, a dense enough cover crop that it just physically prevents that weed from from germinating so a lot of a lot of weed seeds need light to germinate so if you can prevent light from reaching the soil that will certainly prevent uh weeds from even germinating uh, soil temperature can drive weed emergence and so uh, by having the the soil surface shaded out by a cover crop uh could could lower the soil temperature and that that could also prevent uh emergence of of those weed seeds or you could just have enough material there you know just you could think of almost a mulch of of cover crop uh, residue on the surface and if it's thick enough a little weed seedling might germinate but it just doesn't have enough energy to make its way all the way through that that mulch and and emerge uh, to the sunlight where it where it could actually uh, survive and and begin to grow and so uh, those are the primary ways um we also talk about allelopathy as a potential uh, way that uh, cover crops might suppress weeds. And so there's some species that produce these chemicals, these allelopathic chemicals uh, that would have a negative effect on, on weed seed uh, germination and growth. Uh, so cereal rye is one that's known to have uh, some allelopathic chemicals. Uh, you know, we don't know a lot about how that works. Uh, a lot of the research has been done in the laboratory, and so we can show that the chemicals might have a negative effect uh, on these on these germinating weed seeds. Uh, but when you put it out in the field and you have a lot more uh, interacting factors in the soil and all the different things that happen between soil and water and, and crops, uh, cover crops, uh, it's a little bit harder to to pin down exactly what's happening. But we do know that there is some effect uh, from those those chemicals that some of the cover crops produce that, that could also help suppress those weeds. So those are the those are the the ways that I'm I'm aware of that, that cover crops primarily suppress weeds. Hi everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? The American Society of Agronomy and Certified Crop Advisor Program are hosting five IPM webinars between December 2020 and May 2021 to coincide with this mini-series. The American Society of Agronomy's magazine, Crops and Soils, will also be publishing three articles on related IPM topics, including one by Chris titled Using Cover Crops as an IPM Tool for Managing Hard-to-Control Weeds. If you'd like to learn more about any of these resources or related continuing education unit opportunities, you'll find links to them in our show notes. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can also take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode and Chris's article, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Let's get back to the show. That's amazing. I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> um, yeah, super neat. Those are like, 
very different than what I would have just imagined off the top of my head, which is why I don't have your job. <laughs> um, uh, one of many reasons, I'm, I am sure. So now that that is taken care of, I would like to ask again about the uh, examples and success stories and uh, not interrupt you with an additional question. <laughs> hey, I, I don't mind. So I have I have five kids, which we'll get to at the end. But I'm I'm used to interruptions. <laughs> but, 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 so bring them on. If you have questions, ask away. This, this is fun to me to go back and forth. But yeah, when I think about you know how have cover crops worked well in terms of weed suppression, you know we most often cover crops are planted towards the fall, and so most of the success stories look at. Uh, suppressing winter annual weeds. So these are weeds that would germinate in the fall. Uh, they would go dormant during the winter, and then they kind of wake up in the spring and take off. And so they kind of have that jump start on the season. So mare's tail would be a good example, or horseweed is a good example of a, a winter annual weed in, in a lot of our Midwest cropping systems. Um, and, and cover crops have been shown to work pretty effectively at, at uh, suppressing that weed. And so and cover crops often suppress weeds in in kind of two ways. So if I would broaden out kind of my description earlier, you know, cover crops can either reduce the number of weeds in the field. Uh, so they might have an effect of just reducing the number of weeds that, that actually survive and, and make it. So you just have fewer weeds. Uh, but another way that, that cover crops might reduce uh, weed pressure is by reducing the size of the weeds. And so just through competition uh, and, and maybe delaying emergence, uh, you might not reduce the total number of weeds, but the weeds themselves tend to be smaller when you have a cover crop present versus no cover crop. And so uh, uh, cover crops have been shown to have both those effects on, on winter annual weeds, uh, reducing both the number and, and the size of the weeds. Uh, summer annual weeds can be harder to, to manage with a cover crop because often they don't emerge until later into the spring. And so, you know, the, the effect of the cover crop starts to wear off uh, as you move into the spring and you transition to that primary crop. Uh, but there's a study that was done down in, in Kansas that I really like to highlight because I think it, it shows well uh, the ability of cover crops to uh, suppress even summer annual weeds. And so they were looking at the use of cover crops for, for uh, suppressing Palmer amaranth, which is a summer annual weed. And if you know much about Palmer amaranth, it's a really challenging weed to control. It grows quickly. Uh, you know, it can grow uh, several inches a day if everything's happening, uh, happy and it's got water and light and, and everything. And so it, it grows rapidly. It has a really long emergence window. So it might start emerging, say, mid-May, and you could continue to see emergence all the way uh, into August or even September. So that's a really long window that you would have to manage that weed. And so uh, we're always looking for ways to, to try to control Palmer. And, and, uh, and so uh, and it, it develops resistance really easy, so that's another piece of, of the puzzle for, for Palmer. So if we could use cover crops to suppress Palmer, that would be, uh, you know, that would that would be a huge uh, benefit to a lot of our systems. And so when they when they looked at how do cover crops work with Palmer amaranth, you know, one of the things that they found is that uh, they tested several different cover crops. So they looked at use a wheat, oat, uh, a mix, and then a pea, which would be a, a legume instead of a grass. Um, and, and what they found is, is if they had any of the cover crops, it didn't matter which one, just having a cover crop present reduced the number of weeds. So they just had fewer palmer plants where a cover crop was present compared to where they had no cover crop. But what was interesting is, is the, the palmer biomass, so the size of the weeds, uh, that was much more dependent on the amount of cover crop biomass produced. And so they found that the wheat produced the most biomass, and the pea produced the, the least. And the cover crop biomass, as, as the cover crop biomass increased, the weed biomass decreased. And so the more cover crop biomass they had, the less, uh, the less weed biomass was there. Uh, but the other thing that they found that I thought was really interesting is when they looked at the timing of emergence for, for Palmer amaranth and compared where they had no cover crop to where they had a cover crop. And what they found is, is that the cover crop, the wheat in particular, delayed the emergence of the cover crop by almost a month, which is a huge shift in the emergence of that Palmer amaranth. And so if you can imagine if half of your Palmer plants emerged by uh, May 19th, which is what they found in this study, and then you add wheat as a cover crop planted in the fall uh, and let it grow into the spring, uh, 
and then they, they terminated it, getting ready for soybean. And, and they tracked the Palmer emergence uh, where that wheat had been grown, and it delayed half the emergence of those Palmer plants until June 12th. And so that's a huge, huge delay in, in Palmer emergence. And so having that extra month in the spring uh, to allow you to get your crop planted, your crop established up and growing, maybe apply an herbicide with some kind of residual that might prevent the emergence of, of that, of that uh, Palmer amaranth, that could, that could make a huge difference in your ability to uh, control the Palmer, just having that longer window. So in that sense, cover crops could make a, a pretty big difference. And there's one last thing from the study that I think is really interesting to, to highlight, and I, I, I think it's, it's worth pointing out, is they looked at what effect does uh, adding a residual herbicide have to controlling uh, the Palmer amaranth. So they looked at having both cover crop versus no cover crop with and without a residual herbicide. And, and what they found is, is when they added a residual herbicide, they were able to equally reduce the Palmer amaranth biomass. So the, the, the herbicide was pretty effective at controlling uh, the Palmer amaranth in this, in this study. But what's really interesting to me is, is when you compare the, the no herbicide to the herbicide application where there was no cover crop it took the effort of the herbicide to, to control the cover crop so i like to think about is what's who's doing the work uh, so if you don't have any cover crop and you just apply an herbicide well the herbicide does all the work it's doing all the heavy lifting so any control you get is coming from the herbicide whereas if you add a cover crop they never got a hundred percent control with the cover crop so they might have gone from uh uh, 500 uh, pounds of Palmer biomass down to, let's say, 100 pounds of, of Palmer biomass. So it didn't go away completely, but the cover crop reduced pretty significantly uh, the amount of, of, of weed biomass, and then the herbicide did the rest of the work. And so essentially you split up your workload. The cover crop does some of the workload, and it reduces some of the, the weed pressure. And then by adding an herbicide, you might uh, uh, completely control that, that, that weed. But the idea is if, if one of those fails, if the cover crop isn't effective for some reason or the herbicide isn't effective for some reason, it's not a complete failure because you've split your workload. And so I think that, that highlights well for me this idea of this integrated uh, pest management approach in using cover crops is, is can, we, can we divide the workload out? Can we ask different pieces to do different parts of the work when it comes to controlling weeds. And so those are a couple of examples of, of kind of success stories, if you will, of using cover crops for weed suppression. Sure. Um, I have two quick questions off of that. So first of all, uh, if you could define what a residual uh, herbicide is as opposed to just like a regular one. And then also, do you feel that this integrated approach could help slow herbicide resistance in that if some of the weeds are suppressed by the cover crop, then maybe it's less of a problem uh, that they're being exposed to the herbicides? Yeah, no, I think you're on the right track with that second part of your question. When you, when you, I think when you think of resistance management, you know, diversity is is really the key so what led us what leads to resistance is the repeated application of an herbicide over and over on the same uh, plants and and those plants develop resistance over time so that population develops resistance over time uh, so if you can diversify your practices anything you can do to diversify your practices just mixing herbicides together, so using multiple modes of action, so different mechanisms within the plant that the herbicide uses to control. If you have two of those together when you make an application, that drastically reduces uh, the time it takes for resistance to occur. Uh, so uh, I, I think cover crops work in very much the same way, right? It adds, it adds diversity to that system, and so you're exactly right. If, if herbicides can, con or excuse me, if cover crops can control some of those, some of those weeds, uh, you know, it becomes a tool in the toolbox. And, and I think the more tools we have in the toolbox and the more of them that we can use simultaneously, uh, the better off we are uh, in terms of uh, uh, slowing uh, resistant weeds developing. And your, your first question was related to uh, residual herbicides. Um, and so another term for that might be a pre-emerge herbicide is another way to describe. But really it's an herbicide that would be applied, and it, it may or may not... Uh, it may or may not have the ability to control a weed that's emerged. Uh, some of them do, some of them don't. But really what, what we're most interested in with, with these residual herbicides is, is they have 
uh, they, they stay around for a, a period of time, usually say 20 to 30 days uh, uh, in the soil. And what that does is it gives us uh, an extended window of time that it would prevent the emergence of, of new weed seedlings. Uh, and so, as I mentioned with Palmer amaranth, that could be a really important tool where you have a weed that emerges for, for several months. Uh, so if you just went and sprayed uh, what we call a post-emerge herbicide, that would control any weeds that are present that are up and emerge at that time, uh, and those are those are controlled. But if those weeds continue to emerge uh, from the from the soil, uh, they, that means you have to continually to come back and control those weeds over and over again. Or if you use a residual, that gives you a little bit of a window where you get uh, uh, continuous control from from the soil uh, applied herbicide. Uh, does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um. So we're getting close to the end here. I have a few questions left for you. So um, first of all, what? okay, so where are we going with research for um, IPM and cover crops? Like what are areas where we still don't know enough, um, pioneering efforts? Where, where are we going with this? Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, it's one I, I get excited all, uh, excited about, but I certainly don't have uh, all the answers, and so I'm, I'm excited to kind of see the new innovations as they come out as well. Um, but as I think about it, you know, I think, I think having a, we need to improve our understanding of the economics, and I think that's been one of the big challenges of cover crops, is we recognize some of the ecosystem services that they provide, some of the benefits that we know they provide. But how do you, how do you, associate an economic value to soil erosion. We know that it's valuable, and we know that we want to prevent it. Uh, but, you know, if I, if I need to make ends meet in the current cropping season, you know, how do, how do I associate a value for a cover crop that I have to spend money on? I got to buy the seed. I got to drive the planter or the drill through the field and, and plant the cover crop. It takes my time. Uh, uh, and I know that it prevents soil erosion, but what is that, what is that soil erosion worth in, in terms of economic value? So I've spent all this money in this season, but I might not see the reward, if you will, or the payback uh, from, that, from that practice immediately. Uh, it might be, you know, several seasons before I recognize the value of that. Uh, or, or it might not show itself until, you know, it's, it's uh, too late in the case of you lose all of your topsoil and you have nothing left to grow in. Well, now you see the value of it, but, um, you know, so, uh, so those are kind of worst, worst case scenarios, but you know, what's the value in terms of weed suppression? And, and, you know, I, I often get asked, well, can we eliminate an herbicide application by using cover crops? Well, I don't think, I'm not confident to say, yes, uh, we can, we can replace cover crops. Uh, uh we, we can, re we can, you know, input cover crops in place of, of herbicides. I don't, I don't think that's quite where we're at. I think, I think we need to get a little bit better at understanding uh, how our cover crops are growing, how they interact with our crops and our weeds and, and, and those things. And so, like any good scientist, I'm going to hedge a little bit in terms of <laughs> those types of things. But, uh, but I do think improving our understanding of the economic value of cover crops so that, that growers uh, can, can start to... Um, you know, assign an economic value in, in kind of one to two seasons in a relatively, what, what's the short-term economic value? Uh, and, and that, or how do you make the long-term economic values uh, uh, pay, right? How do you justify some of those expenses? And so I think understanding that is, is really critical. And then I think the other piece that, that really interests me, and I've done some, some research on this, but uh, I feel like my understanding is, is pretty limited at this point is, as we think about managing herbicide resistance, for example, uh, what do we need to do in terms of our cropping system? So uh, a lot of the work so far has looked at, can we keep our corn and soybean rotation kind of as is, and can we add things to it or tweak things around the edges that, that would help us but not change our, our cropping system dramatically? And I start to think, uh, can we think more broadly? Uh, can, we, can we maybe imagine more broadly about... Uh, can we change our whole cropping system, maybe uh, add different crops to the rotation? Um, you know, some of the research we've done has looked at, can we use shorter season 
uh, soybeans, for example. So that means that they would uh, mature faster and would harvest sooner. And that would give us a little longer window uh, in the fall to plant cover crops uh, and to get them up and, and produce more biomass. And so there's trade-offs there again. You know, So can we maintain some of our, our yields and our production on those shorter season beans if we manage them right? And so uh, a lot of it, for me, uh, comes back to how do we manage the whole system uh, and how do we think more broadly about the system so um, hopefully that helps a little bit think of how I'm imagining some of these things and I, I know there's there's a whole lot of other uh, people that are doing this work and, and would have uh, amazing answers to that question as well so it'll be fun to watch and see what comes these next couple of years yeah for sure I like that because it it kind of lends itself to the whole point of like integrated pest management or even holistic uh, IPM like we talked about on a previous episode of just like you have to look at everything and you know even talking about how they suppress the weeds is like well it's a lot of things and we're not always sure like what exactly is the thing that killed this particular weed um so I love that so I've got three questions left then uh, first one is if people want to learn more about uh, these topics, where can they go? Man, there's so much information out these days on, on cover crops. Um, and so I think you'd mentioned that you'd be able to provide some links uh, in the show notes. And so I'll, I'll make sure that those are available uh, to you. Um, but, you know, I, I write a number of articles uh, for University of Nebraska. Uh, we, we call it Crop Watch here. Uh, but that's where we put a lot of our extension articles. And so uh, we have quite a few covered crop-related articles there. Um, another uh, another place that I like to, to look where there's a lot of good information about cover crops and, and some of the things we've talked about today would be the Midwest Cover Crops Council. Uh, and so that, uh, I think that's an organization that, that's done a lot of good work uh, in terms of pushing cover crops forward into our systems. And then... Uh, SARE is another organization that, that has a lot of good information about cover crops as well. And so uh, in terms of cover crops, those are, those are some uh, resources that I'm aware of. And then uh, another, another one that I like to follow, um, it's, the, uh, it's the International Herbicide-Resistant Weed Database. And so that's continuously updated, but that shows all the different uh, resistance cases and, and organizes it in different ways. So you can kind of see what, what uh, weed resistant looks like uh, around the world. Um, and I think it's helpful to keep track of, of what res- you know, what, where we're at in terms of resistance and, and thinking, about, thinking about some of that as well. Absolutely. We will definitely include links to those in our show notes. Um, so then if people want to take the next step and maybe get involved in some of this, what can they do? Yeah, I think, you know, is, as I talk to different growers, uh, you know, everyone has different level of experience with these things. Um, my advice usually is, uh, when it comes to cover crops, uh, I think outlining your goals is really important. So what do you hope to accomplish by including a cover crop, uh, in your, in your farming practices. And so I think, you know, is it weed suppression? Uh, and if that's the case, then I think that helps you kind of hone in what you want to do and what you want to try, maybe what cover crops you want to want to select. Um, so I think that's important. And then I think starting small is another uh, piece of advice that I would, I would give if, if you wanted to start using cover crops, don't go out and and plant a whole quarter section to cover crops if you've never done it before. Uh, there's just a learning curve to it. And I've, I've seen farmers that have done it for years and years, and they make it look easy, uh, and they're really good at it, and they get really uh, uh, good outcomes from using cover crops. Um, but then you talk to other people that it's their first time trying it, and they go out, and, and it just doesn't work right. And it they think they're doing everything the same, but uh, there's little things from how do you set your planter differently by having a cover crop residue there uh, there's you know there's all kinds of little things that it just helps to figure out and so either getting involved in an on-farm research program i know many different states have those uh, where you might be able to work with somebody to design uh, a couple little trials to compare cover crops versus no cover crops or just trying it on 40 acres instead of uh, a whole field and just see uh, how does it work on your on your farm uh, so i think kind of starting slow talking to other people that have done it um, and kind of slowly uh, working your way uh, into using cover crops would be probably the best advice I would give. 
Sure, that's great advice. Um, final question then. What is one fun fact about you that people would not know if all they had was your research? Yeah, so I, I kind of spoiled it earlier, but I do have five kids. I have two dogs. And so there's lots of activity at my place. Um, and we're always looking for some kind of outside adventure. So we all really enjoy rock climbing. That's one of my, my hobbies. And so anytime we can get outside and and play outside. Uh, that's what we like to do. Wow. Busy household. <laughs> How fun, though. Um, well, that's great. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be on our show. We really appreciate it and all the work that you're doing um, on all of the uh, extension and weed control. That's great work. So thank you for being on our show. Yeah, thanks, Abby. I appreciate the invitation. It was fun. for listening to Field Lab Earth. This podcast is sponsored by the Kellogg Company. Kellogg is committed to reach 1 million farmers and workers globally by the end of 2030 with programs that support resilient farmers, communities, and ecosystems. The opinions shared on this podcast are independent from our sponsor. You'll find links to today's resources in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe, and don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find your podcasts if you like our show. We're also available on Lyceum, the world's first audio learning community, where you can join our discussion group and comment on each episode. This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by guests are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Craft Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers. <laughs>